A low-lying island of green forest and marsh, areas of sparsely vegetated sand, tufts of plants grow from the dunes. Their home is a narrow ribbon of sand, shaped by wind. Trees flutter in the breeze. And wave. A wave washes over the sand. Assateague Island, where plants and animals follow the rhythms of tide and season. Two horses wade through a marsh. Bound to this untamed land, horses have adapted, living free, returning back to the wild. Words appear, back to the wild, a wild horses of Assateague Island. Below, the surf washes a sandy beach. Assateague Island is a 37-mile-long barrier island along the coast of Maryland and Virginia. It's the eastern edge of the North American continent, where land gives way to the Atlantic Ocean. Gentle waves lap the sandy shore. Constantly changing, the island supports an intricate web of life. Rich, vibrant, resilient. Cactus grows, a green frog climbs. At the waterline and on the beach, animals blend into their sandy home. A toad burrows in sand. Behind the dunes, plants shelter from the ocean spray, while trees twist and bend under the stress of salt and wind. Wind blows the trees. Along the bayside, mosquitoes and dragonflies have specially adapted to live in and around salt water. A dragonfly perches on a blade of grass. Many of these plants are finely tuned to their barrier island habitats and live nowhere else. A small plant sprouts from the sand. But if an animal can survive on acetique, it may thrive. And no animal embodies this more clearly than the island's wild horses. A lone horse stands at the water's edge. A golden sun rises over the trees. The horse's story on acetique begins more than 300 years ago. Horses stroll in short grass. Mainland colonists put horses to pasture on the island in order to avoid livestock taxes. A horse grazes. The island served as a natural corral. Horses gallop on the beach. Left alone, their survival depended on instinctive behaviors. A horse with a long, coarse mane. Over time, memories of the horse's origins faded, emerging again as a new, colorful story. Horses gather on the beach. Local folklore described how a Spanish ship wrecked off the coast and horses swam ashore. Hoofprints dot the sand. Genetic studies reveal a more complex ancestry, the result of continuing introductions of new horses over the centuries. Horses climb up and gallop through the sand dunes. More than 300 years later, Assateague's wild horses are flourishing. A brown horse strolls on the beach, its long tail trailing in the breeze. Today, they live in two distinct and separate herds. Three horses walk at the water's edge. In Virginia, the southern herd consists of roughly 150 horses. They graze leased areas in the Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge, and their lives are closely linked to local traditions. A crowd approaches on horseback. They belong to the Chincoteague Volunteer Fire Company. Men ride horseback on the beach, guiding a herd of smaller horses. Every July since the 1920s, volunteers, known as saltwater cowboys, round them up. Dozens of cowboys ride along. They herd the horses along the beach, then swim them across the bay to Chincoteague. There, the Volunteer Fire Company auctions the foals to raise money. The herd swims across the bay and walks onto the grassy shore. To the north, in Maryland, another herd roams. Their lives are very different. Carl Zimmerman. The National Park Service horses, as best as we can, are managed as wildlife. That's a hands-off approach, no supplemental feeding, no veterinarian care in general. They're pretty much on their own to live or die as wildlife. Wild and untamed, 
the horses have become as rugged as their home. Their short legs and stocky build are perfectly suited to the landscape. Sand and marsh pose no obstacle for these sure-footed horses. A group of brown and white horses cross shallow water. They've adapted to the challenging conditions of every season. Snow covers the ground. When the weather turns cold, they grow thick winter coats. A shaggy horse grazes. Throughout the year, they graze mostly on coarse grasses. Their diet also includes twigs, phragmites, and even an unlikely delicacy, poison ivy. Because most of their food is coated with salt, they drink twice as much fresh water as domesticated horses. They find it in the island's ponds and shallow rainwater pools. All of the salt and water combine to give the horses a bloated appearance. Wild horses have adapted so well to acetique, they can alter the island itself. A horse grazes in shallow water. As a non-native species, on acetique, the horses can have a pretty dramatic effect on, on virtually the entire ecosystem of acetique island, ranging from individual plants, plant communities, other organisms dependent upon those plant communities, right up to the physical processes that shape Assateague Island. From beach to bay, horses can have an impact on all of Assateague's habitats. The horses' effects in the salt marsh are particularly evident. In a normal, healthy marsh, you would expect to see grasses up to your knees. In a lot of areas on Assateague, it's down around your ankles, where it looks more like a golf course than it does a healthy salt marsh. In addition to the effects on the plants themselves, that grazing has also displaced other organisms from the salt marsh, things like fiddler crabs, secretive marsh birds. Those creatures have been displaced because of the effects of the horses on that salt marsh habitat. A shorebird bathes. Tufts of grass grow from the sand dunes. American beach grass is another favorite of the horses. When they overgraze, they can damage a key part of the island. Beach grass roots act like small anchors holding dunes in place. Without beach grass, dunes can blow away. And with weakened dunes, the island becomes more vulnerable to erosion. Waves pound the beach, carving an edge in the sand. To preserve a balance between wild horses in Maryland and barrier island habitats, scientists and the National Park Service have developed an innovative program to maintain 80 to 100 horses. Allison Turner. It's a safe, non-hormonal vaccine that prevents pregnancy in mares without altering their natural behavior. A vaccine-filled dart is fired from a rifle. The vaccine is delivered to the horses without a human ever handling them, so they don't become habituated to people. Allison, carrying a rifle, gazes at two horses. Dr. J. Kirkpatrick has led this groundbreaking program for over 20 years. Yeah, that's right. So step one is you find the mare. Okay, she's the one we want. And then you mix your vaccine. He pumps two joined syringes. You have to actually mix this vaccine right on the spot. He withdraws a hypodermic needle from the end of a dart, then loads the dart in the chamber of a rifle. Step two is you've got to get within shooting distance of the mare. And that can take a long time. That's probably the most frustrating part of the whole set of steps. The horses gallop away. Many horses recognize the National Park Service uniform and personnel. Allison slowly approaches a group of horses. They've learned how close the ranger needs to get. The horses walk away and stay just out of range. Horses trot away as Allison walks behind with a rifle strapped to her shoulder. Jay, also bearing a rifle, peers through a spotting scope. Then step three is taking the shot. We dart the horse only in the rump, a lot of muscle. The dart startles more than it stings. And step four is recovering the dart. You want to test to make sure that that dart has fired. 
Each dart delivers a year's dose of vaccine. And the fifth and final step is to take a little piece of grass or weed and to run it down the needle of the dart. That tells you whether it fired. When it hits the plunger and you know it's fired, it just is a feeling like nothing else I know, particularly if it's been a tough horse. And you're filled with elation for 15 minutes until you realize you've got to go get another horse now and start the process all over again. The National Park Service vaccinates mares at two, three, and four years old. And then they are allowed to foal. After a mare gives birth to one foal, she may be vaccinated annually. Allison loads a dart into a rifle chamber. Assateague's program has been such a success, several other wildlife management organizations have modeled their own programs after it. I really had no idea whether we could make this work when we started, and it, it's been spectacular, actually. Jay walks with a rifle over his shoulder. Because mayors give birth just once, and only in their prime years, they lead longer and healthier lives. And since almost every mare foals, there's a healthy mix to the gene pool. Every spring, a few new foals arrive, maintaining a stable population. Wobbly at first, foals can walk within an hour or two of birth. A foal walks gingerly through the grass. A young foal sticks close to its mother, spending most of its days nursing or napping. A foal follows a mare through the tall grass, its white tail switching from side to side. A larger foal follows a mare through belly deep water. As they grow stronger, they venture a little farther, though still sleeping for hours each day. A foal lies down, its nose poking into the sand. Visitors often think that when a horse is lying down, it must be sick. But even adult horses lie on their sides for short periods of deep sleep. Some like to doze with their legs tucked beneath them. This is perfectly natural behavior. More commonly, all horses catch short naps standing up. This is what grabbing a few quick winks looks like for a horse. One hind leg cocked, neck lowered, and ears flopped to the side. A horse stands motionless in the grass. On their own, horses exhibit natural behavior. Automobiles crowd a road. But in an unnatural setting, their behavior can be altered in ways that pose a threat to both animals and humans. A horse blocks traffic. When horses learn that people might feed them, they hang around roads. A horse walks in the road. As a result, drivers have unintentionally hit and killed many horses. Others have been injured but survived. One of the surest ways to put a horse in jeopardy is to offer it food. The potential harm from close contact isn't one-sided either. When people get too close to wild horses, they get hurt. Try and don't go behind the horse. Okay? You never walk behind a horse. A bite can wound, and a kick can do even more damage. Several times a year, visitors suffer serious injuries because they got too close. Horses cross a road as people stand near. These are large, powerful, and unpredictable animals, not domesticated horses, and definitely not pets. Horses gallop along a road. And that's exactly what we value most about them, their wildness. If they become habituated to people, they'll lose the independence and self-reliance that make them so special. A horse stands while people walk in the surf. Assateek Island is one of the few places where we can still see horses as wild animals. A group of horses congregate at the surf. Left to themselves, they've returned to ancient behaviors. They form bands in which each animal has its own rank and role. A typical social group, called a harem band, includes a mature stallion his mares, and their young. A band saunters through the grass. 
It's a clear hierarchy, with the lead mayor determining where and when the group moves, eats, and drinks. Horses within a band groom each other to strengthen social bonds. Nibbling and touching seem to help bind the group together and calm them down. Horses nuzzle one another. The stallion's primary role is to guard his band. A stallion raises his head, then begins to approach. A second stallion rears up and changes course. When another stallion gets too close, he may try herding the mares away. If the challenger keeps up his pursuit, a confrontation begins with posture and displays. When neither stallion backs down, a fierce battle of kicks and bites follows. Stallions kick up their hind legs as others approach. One jabs at another with a front hoof. Others circle each other and give sharp kicks and bites. One stallion scoots away as another kicks toward him. Almost all stallions bear battle scars. A young male learns by play fighting, honing life skills he'll need later. A horse prances across a dune. When he begins to show interest in the mares, the lead stallion will drive him from the group. The young stallion then wanders alone or joins a small, temporary bachelor band. Three horses gather on a flat stretch of sand. Young females usually leave their family band on their own, which helps avoid inbreeding. They'll join an established harem band or pair up with a single lucky bachelor. Together, they'll form the core of a completely new band. At twilight, horses stand near the surf. Pink flowers bloom. A white egret flies past. Horses gallop along the shore. Each band has a home range. They spend most of their days grazing in the marshes and open areas on the bayside. Cattle egrets often hitch a ride on their backs. From this vantage point, the bird can spot insects stirred up as the horses graze. An egret rides the horse through tall grass. Mosquitoes are irritating, and biting flies can draw blood. Horses deal with these bites and itches in a variety of ways. A horse rubs its neck on a small tree. A quick scratch helps and anything solid becomes a rubbing post. But nothing's better than a good old-fashioned roll. Horses roll on the beach and in the grass. Three horses trot across the dunes. During the hot and humid summer when swarms of biting flies become too much to bear, wild horses seek refuge on the beach. The breeze and salt spray cool them off and keep flies away. Standing on the beach, horses face a churning surf. Unafraid and curious, Assateague's horses view the beach as their own. Two horses trot down the beach. The best approach is to give them their space. Brown horses stand facing the ocean as a rolling surf strikes the beach. A gentle wave washes over the sand, then begins its retreat. A sunbeam pierces a gap in the clouds, its reflection shimmering on a calm ocean. Two horses wander near the surf. Humans have been associated with horses for thousands of years. A mare escorts a foal. It is only natural that we are drawn to them. A foal rises up off the sand. On Assateague Island, wild horses rekindle something deep within us something timeless and meaningful to our lives. A horse gallops by. Strength and grace, raw power and beauty. These extraordinary creatures, connected so intimately with one another and to their natural environment. Horses trot along the shore, others wade through a shallow bay. They bring us back to a place we perhaps had forgotten. Horses saunter across a sand dune, their long tails waving. Back to the wild. A horse strides among the dunes. Another ambles through shrubs and grass, then pauses, its long shaggy mane and forelock partially obscuring its eyes. 
revealed in slow motion, a band of six horses gallops down the beach. One horse is tan, the rest are brown. Their hooves splash in the shallow edge of the surf, their long tails trailing behind. Film credits appear on a black screen. Words appear, presented by National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior, copyright 2009.